hey, don't want to wait so long in between main channel meatball content? Well, check out some links in the description, because these thumbnails on screen are other videos you probably missed. How's it going, everybody? Chaotic Meatball here, and welcome back to the channel. So today, we're finally jumping back into the wacky world of Pokemon ROM hacks, this time with one of the best on the Game Boy Advance, Pokemon Gaia. This Regigigas-based ROM hack features a brand new region by the name of Orbtis, and contains Pokemon all the way through Gen 6, so we're in for quite the amount of options. Speaking of options, those are going to be from Among the Ghost type. We've got Bayonet, Dusknoir, Gengar, Trevenant, Chandelure, Frostlass, Mismagius, Cofagrigus, Driftblim, Spiritum, Shedinja, Sableye, Rotom, Jellicent, and Aegislash all available. But I won't be able to capture every one of them because five of them are actually housed in the same area. Though, because we don't have a starter Pokemon, that's part Ghost, I'll be allowing two Pokemon to be captured from that area. One is my quote-unquote starter, and the other is my actual Wisp Forest encounter. Speaking of which, I've actually made a wheel weighted towards the encounter rates of these Pokemon to see what my starter would actually be, and despite it being a 5% encounter rate and a very small slice on the wheel, Litwick was the one that was spun. Unfortunately, Litwick was not just available in Wisp Forest, it's also over in the Telmark warehouses, so I was hoping to hold off on that encounter, but judging by the types of the early game gyms like Fairy, Fire, and Bug, I might be better off with it now rather than later. With that said though, let's just jump in, since this is going to be a long one. Make sure to like, comment, and subscribe, and let's try to win without dying, you know? That's, that's the goal, right? <laughs> so first of all, I've got to grab my starter. Now, as much as I would have loved to, I can't actually just change my starter Chimchar to my spun Litwick. I tried to use PK Hex to see if it was possible to adjust, but due to there being over 386 Pokemon in this Gen 3 ROM hack, and a few other factors that changes how the save file is handled, I just straight up cannot use it for things like this, as well as accelerating grinding like I normally would for these runs. But hey, that's the price we pay for a new experience. With that said though, I just proceed on through with my Chimchar from this game's professor named Redwood, training it as a regular Nuzlocke and not capturing anything, getting to the first gym and just barely eking it out, thanks to a lucky burn off of Ember on Clefairy, a two-shot on Ralts with Scratch and Ember, and Jigglypuff being an idiot and going for Defense Curl on one of the turns rather than just spamming Pound. I'm barely able to scrape by on a win with 2 HP. But this is where the true fun begins. Now that I have the first badge, I can access the Wisp Forest, the home of both my first encounter, Shuppet, and my actual starter, Litwick. Of course, I made sure to make my rival have Piplup since that's the super effective one against my starter, but it probably won't matter much aside from the fact that Steel types can be a wee bit difficult to take out with Ghost types, though I'm sure I'll be fine when we get to that point. After grinding these ghost tricks up to an appropriate level, I can proceed on through Wisp Forest, getting to Fernando and actually obtaining the badge that I technically already won, but he was too upset to give me earlier. With Cut in Hand as well, I can teach that to Monferno and proceed from Saros Village into Archon Tunnel for some story, then head on through Erois Road to make it into Erois City. There's a bit of a scuffle with this game's evil team here, though they're not actually called a team. Rather, they're just the new elders. They're attempting to bring about the power of Regigigas, seeing as they need to awaken the three main titans first, but I'm pretty easily able to wipe the floor with the grunts. Nothing much else is here, but I also figured I'd do a little bit more grinding to get Litwick and Shepet up to level 19. Heading back to the Archon Tunnel with Professor Redwood to get the HM4 Rock Smash, teaching it to Monferno as well before backtracking through Archon Tunnel to get back into Archon Town, where a hidden grotto happens to contain the TM for Rock Tomb. I don't think this will be that useful for my team, but I'm making sure to use a walkthrough to leave no stones unturned since I'm sure there's a lot of things I would miss otherwise. Solanto Path is my next destination now that I have access to Rock Smash, going into a previously unexplored area named the Nespine Climb, taking out the trainers there and making it into Nespine Town itself. This is the home of the second gym leader, but we have our second rival fight to take care of beforehand. So I figured I'd clean up the remaining available trainers before taking him on since he's got four team members compared to my two. He leads off with Makahita as I go with Shuppet, attempting to land Will-O-Wisp, missing, and getting sand attacked. I try once more and thankfully do land it through that sand attack as the second one lands, so I just swap into Litwick, attempting to land Confuse Ray. 
I'm basically planning to use Minimize to cheese my way through this fight since I don't think I can get through his other three members with these unevolved dinky ghost types, so I swap in and out again to get out of the sand attack, beginning my Minimize attempts and thankfully not getting hit by a single sand attack before the burn eventually works through Makahita's HP, wasting a super potion in the process before taking him down with a flame burst. Second out is Roggenrola, and I figured Flame Burst would do plenty of damage, and sure enough it does despite being resistant, two-shotting the Boulder Boy as Rock Blast misses, leading to Prinpla. I basically have to hope this guy misses over and over again, and to help ensure that happens, I use Confuse Ray, getting him to hit himself once, though he gets out of it really quickly and misses another bubble. Thankfully, Nightshade is doing enough for this to be a three-shot, so as long as I get another bubble miss, I should be safe. And I do, getting to Swablu and swiftly taking it down in two flame bursts for the win. That would have been disastrous without Minimize. Uh, literally, there is no if, ands, or buts about that if I had no other recourse. With that said, though, I can get into the gym, and this gym is actually the home of the flying type. Unfortunately, Arya here, the gym leader, leads with Vullaby, who's part dark type but it doesn't really have any dark moves. Instead, it has Aerial Ace, which also <laughs> nullifies Minimize. Gotta love how this is the perfect counter. I'm still gonna take damage, but there's no way I'm gonna be able to take any attacks from the rest of her team if I don't still do the Minimize tactic. So I do enough damage with Shepet to get Vullaby down to low yellow, so that when I swap and use Confuse Ray with Litwick, I'll get her free healing turn to use Minimize. I'll actually manage to get three of these off uninterrupted before an Aerial Ace manages to make it through thanks to the confusion, KOing with a Flame Burst as Gligar's in second. It immediately tries to fire Knock Off, a super effective move that does more damage because I'm holding an item, thankfully missing as I go for Confuse Ray to help set up my last three minimizes, but it keeps breaking through. I'm getting ridiculously lucky with the missing, uh, but at least I'm able to set up the last three as knockoff gets used over and over, landing exactly zero times before I confuse her again, getting Gligar to hit herself twice in a row as two flame bursts takes her out. Last up is Chadot, and it also has Aerial Ace. Plus it does exactly half of Litwick's remaining HP. I have no other recourse other than to hope that this next one gets a low roll, and thankfully it does, leaving Litwick on exactly one HP before I KO with flame burst for the win. This early game is getting to be very rough due to the lack of ghost types available early, and I saw this coming 1000%, otherwise I would have stuck it out with one ghost type. There was no way I was making it through without the two from Wisp Forest, especially with level caps being an inhibitor as well. Now that I've got the plume badge and the TM for Roost in hand though, I'm able to finally make my way through Frostbite Cave. Initially the map was blocked off since the new elders needed to mine their way through, and Apparently that gym battle was just long enough for them to get through. This gives me access to my next encounter on the third floor, that being a female snow run. Now, I can't access a Dawnstone quite yet, so I can't use it, but due to having just gotten the EXP share around the second gym, I can use it at least as a pit of experience due to the level cap only going up from 23 to 28, which is not exactly much maneuverability when you only have two Pokemon and about 20 required trainers that I'm going to need to take down. Before I make it to the end of the cave, I find the TM for Shadow Claw, and this is going to be fantastic, because this game has the physical special split, so a physical ghost type move will be deeply appreciated when we get around to mons like On Edge and Shed Inja. At the end of the tunnel ends up being an Elder Knight, uh, I'd assume would be considered an admin? They're named Eunice, and this fight is actually quite terrifying. I have to take out a grunt that has a ball toy, diggersby, and a binacle directly before Eunice without healing in between, so I've got to make sure I train up for this. I'm pretty close to the level cap, so I'm not going to go past level 26, but thankfully with this hack's rebalancing, Shuppet evolves into Bayonet level 25, giving me access to a pretty strong attacker. Bayonet's able to get through all three of the grunt's Pokemon without taking a single point of damage, leaving Eunice's form on team. First up is Snover, and unfortunately, I can't change my lead either, so I'm stuck with Bayonet trying to wail on his thing with Hex, barely doing under half, so I swap over to Shadow Sneak for the KO. Frostlass is out second, and this is exactly why I kept Shadow Sneak over teaching Shadow Claw yet. That thing has a base 110 speed, and I need to KO it before, well, it KOs me because it's faster. Mora is up third, and it's a bit of a brick house on the physical side, but Hex is able to put in some good work, hitting for just under half as Mist gets used. 
and to play around healing items, I tried to go for Shadow Sneak, but it did a little bit more damage than I had anticipated, getting hit by Aurora Beam to be brought into the red after Kale. Fortunately, the healing item doesn't exist, so I KO with a second Shadow Sneak as Noctowl comes in last. Bayonet's basically down for the rest of this fight, so I've got to solo Noctowl with Litwick, and thanks to the Hail and Flame Burst, I'm able to outpace Noctowl's damage after Confuse Ray lands, seeing a Reflect and a Confusion, but Noctowl does the haha -ha funny and KOs itself off of Confusion. Very funny, gotta appreciate it. That was also a bit close though. Thankfully, I had something that worked instead of Minimize, but still, it was very close. Windmist City is just outside, housing the third gym, who's oddly enough a fire user in the icy area, but I do like the subversion of expectations, though I've got some more business to handle with the new elders first. The Windmist Summit has a few required trainers for me to go through, and thanks to Snowrunt being a good experience sink, I'm barely able to make it through all of them, as well as the new elders grunts that are up in the tower that's north I don't remember what it's called, but either way, I make it through them as well as the Windmist City Gym Trainers to get to Nina, the Fire-type user. She's got a pretty stacked team for this point in the game, starting off with Pignite, so I lead with Bayonet so I could bait out a Fire-type move, swap to Litwick since it has Flash Fire, then lock him into Rollout. This is so both of them level up to level 29 during this first Pokemon, Though it doesn't actually matter with Rollout having 90% accuracy, it actually misses both times it's used, KOing with three Shadow Claws after a Super Potion from Bayonet as Magmar comes in second. Shadow Claw brings it down into the red as he uses Leer, getting me off scot-free again as Hex KOs and Heatmore comes in third. Shadow Claw does a little over half as Hone Claws gets used, boosting her attack and accuracy, but nothing relevant as a second Shadow Claw KOs, leaving just Camerupt. And despite being minus one defense, the best thing she can hit me with here is Rock Slide, doing a single point over half, but thanks to Berry Juice being a purchasable item by this point in the game, I can use it as a held item, healing 20 HP, surviving through another Rock Slide if I needed to, but not that I do since a second Shadow Claw KOs, and I'm off to the races to the fourth gym. I finally have access to the bike as well, not that it matters, but hey, it's there. This section, however, is finally where I get access to some new encounters. However, I've got to make it through one more important fight first, seeing as I need the TM for Surf to get to the next one. Arriving on Sabalo Island leads me to the Sabalo Tower. You remember the Tower of Mastery in Pokemon X and Y where you get the Mega Bracelet? Yeah, it's literally just the same thing, but with a random character named Belle. Unfortunately, due to that Mega Evolution, I need to ensure I'm ready to fight her, and the only way I'm going to do that is by grinding both Bayonet and Litwick to level 33, evolving the latter into Lampet, and thanks to a Dusk Stone I gained access to by showing someone in Salanto Town, the beginning town by the way, a Shuppet, I can evolve it again into Chandelure. This should be good enough. She leads off with Heracross, an easy Flame Burst KO, especially with a held Charcoal I got earlier in the run. Mawile second, same thing here, Flame Burst and goodbye. Third out is Main Nectric, and I honestly didn't expect Flame Burst to one-shot that one either, but good on Chandelure. Even Sableye, her fourth Pokemon, is no match, leaving just Audino. And this one is the Mega Evolution, so I just keep spamming Flame Burst, doing half off of a critical as Attract lands. Boy, this is a beefy bastard. So I swap into Bayonet, taking Baby Doll Eyes and missing with Will-O-Wisp as a new attack in Charming Cry lands twice before I finally manage to land a Will-O-Wisp. Berry Juice keeps Bayonet a bit more healthy than I would have been otherwise, hitting Knock Off before getting too much damage on it, so I swap back in a Chandelure, taking one more Charming Cry, then KOing with Flame Burst for the win. Well, <laughs> shoot, I haven't used Chandelure in a while, and I forgot how strong this thing can be. Can't wait to get the TM for Flamethrower so I have an even better fire move, but Flame Burst should do for now since it's 70 power, it's alright. However, with that, the new elders have somehow awakened Regirock, because that fight was just long enough to do that, so I gotta go chase them off again. The grunts are rather easy to handle thanks to Chandelure sweeping through them rather quickly, both of which using a Diggers Bee and a Knock Towel. But now I've gotta fight off another one of their knights, Enoch, and... Holy moly, is that lead Tyrantrum a problem? Thankfully, the AI prioritizes Stealth Rock here, so I can get off two hexes to KO, otherwise that would have been probably the end of Chandelure. Galurk is second, and Hex is a one-shot, obviously. Aerodactyl is third, and... 
Unfortunately, I need to stay in here. Hex does well over half, but I'm not going to risk it again. I swap into Bayonet to take a Supersonic, getting hit with Bite, and fortunately hitting through Confusion to KO with Knock Off, leaving just Diggersby. Confusion does some damage to Bayonet as she sets up Sword Stance, then again the following turn. This is kind of why I wanted to hold Bayonet, because I was risking death here with this Diggersby having Sword Stance and likely a move to hit me. So I finally get out of Confusion, hitting Will-O-Wisp, but thankfully not going down as a third and final Sword Stance is set up. Well, anything it's going to attack me with, it's going to kill, so I... Wait. Does this thing just not have anything to attack me with? I guess not, since I swap back into Chandelure, and I see a fourth and useless Sword Stance come up when I get into Chandelure, KOing with a single Flame Burst after the burn damage does enough residually. How the heck did that Diggersby not have a Ground-type move? I actually found the trainer document, since I couldn't find it before, I dug for it so that I'd be able to check after this fight. And yeah, Tiggersby has double kick, takedown, and quick attack as the attacking moves, meaning it was absolutely zero threat whatsoever to ghost types. <sighs> well, I would have just swapped into Chandelure instead of taking confusion damage then. Oh well. Anyway, I managed to get the HM for Surf straight after, opening up my next encounter in Frillish, which is available here on Sabalo Island, adding the water typing to my team to balance out the pure ghost and the ghost fire decently. I just immediately slapped the EXP share onto this one since there's no reason to have it on Snow Run at this point, and I still need an EXP sync since both Chandelure and Bayonet are getting rather close to the level cap of 36. Thankfully, the fourth gym is close, just three more small areas to get through in the Sharp Gust Span, South Sea Stretch, and Valoon Way. None of them really put up much of a fight against Bayonet, though the surfing routes do make it so that my Chandelure can't really get used, even though we're really getting close to the level cap. After a few trainer fights though, I'm in Valoon Town, but of course there's some more story to take care of. There's a mural in the Archon Tunnel that I didn't talk about with a fossil Pokemon on it, and the same thing happens to be in Nemesis Cave, however, this one has a lily on it. So I go check it out, T they tell me that they're researching it, and that the gym leader won't be ready for a bit, so I go into the bug catching contest. And that's actually absolutely perfect, since the encounter that I'm getting next here is Ninkata, getting the third place prize and opening up the gym afterwards. There's technically one more encounter I can get beforehand, but I'd rather get the gym badge first. It's a trade, and I don't know if I have any restrictions on me, whether or not the level is still 30, or if that doesn't exist at all in this ROM hack. I didn't look it up, because I'm dumb. So I just leave it out. If there is restrictions, it should be increased to level 50 post 4th gym, so it won't be a problem after the gym leader either way. Beforehand, though, I made sure to EV train, and this is definitely where I felt the slog of grinding, because... Lord have mercy, EV training takes a long time. I wanted to EV train Shedinja in attack and speed, as well as Frillish and special attack and speed, since who needs defenses? So I go all the way back to the beginning areas, finding the lowest level Pokemon that I can yield, the right EVs, and sure, speed is pretty easy, because most early game mons yield speed, but there really weren't many Pokemon that were low level that specialized in exactly special attack, other than Badoo being a very rare encounter, though the Archon Tunnel was at least helpful in the physical attack department, thanks to Driller in Paris, as well as special attack with Numel, though they were around the level 9 to 11 range. Paris was rather scary to attack here as well, thanks to effects Spore and Poison Powder possibly making an appearance, but thankfully that wasn't a worry, though it was the reason this video is coming out a day later than I would like. And you know that it took a long time to grind, because I found myself a shiny Joltik while grinding for special attack EVs. I caught it because you all would probably yell at me in the comments if I didn't, though most likely you'll yell at me for capturing a non-ghost type, so there is no winning. With all that out of the way though, it's time for Vernon, the bug type leader, and it wouldn't be a chaotic meatball video if it wasn't for one of these fights being just click A turbo. Chandelure and Flame Burst absolutely tears through this chump, though the lead Shuckle doesn't go down in one shot, rather it takes five after a Hyper Potion and tries to use Rock Slide multiple times, but who decided putting an attacking move on Shuckle was a good idea? Second out is Scizor, offered as Sacrifice to Flame Burst, as was Masquerine after trying to use Intimidate in vain, KOing with a critical as punishment. This leaves just Beedrill to Mega Evolve, then immediately die to Flame Burst for the KO in the win. 
I'm gonna have to find the Benedite though, since I'm sure there's plenty of trainers coming up that use Mega Evolutions, and it seems like it could be a useful item. So now it's time to go ahead and grab that new encounter I was talking about earlier. Just to the north of the Loon Town is the Nemesis River, and there I can find a 5% encounter in Zangoose. Of course, this isn't our encounter, since it's not a ghost type, but we can trade it for a Spiritomb over in Valoon Town's Gate, a nearly weakness-free, bulky Pokémon that has access to many good moves like Dream Eater, Nasty Plot, Dark Pulse, Shadow Ball. There's going to be a lot of use coming out of this amalgamation of 108 spirits. That's, uh, well, I guess why they nicknamed it that. <laughs> anyway, exiting to the right of Valoon Town is the Telmark Swamp. Luckily, our rival provided us with a gas mask to get across here after the last gym. Which is kind of alarming that you need a gas mask of all things to get through part of the region. But beforehand, I made sure to backtrack to the Wind Mist Summit, since the martial artist that was initially blocking this area is gone, giving me access to a Dawnstone and therefore Frostlass. Finally, a full team! There's still a few other encounters throughout the run that I can potentially get, but I'm pretty content just sitting on these fellows and carrying onward. After EV training, of course. Oh, the pain that is EV training. This is the main reason why I'm not grabbing anything new, even though I'm probably better off if I do. Back to progression, at the end of the Telmark Swamp is a rival fight, and it's a pretty jam-packed team. He leads off with Hariyama, a pretty good opportunity to start off with Spiritomb, as the only attack he has to connect with me is Knock Off, which after getting rid of my Berry Juice has half the power it would if it was knocking off an item, so a Hypnosis and two Dream Eaters is enough to put him down. Second is Boldor, which does nothing but use Iron Defense as two Ominous Winds connects to KO, getting the Omni Boost on the second, and allowing for an Ominous Wind and a Sucker Punch to KO his third Pokémon in Leafeon after it wastes a turn with Swords Dance. Fourth is Rotom, and since it's currently in the Ghost-type base form, an Ominous Wind takes care of that immediately, leading to Altaria 5th. Somehow Spiritomb outspeeds here, I figured plus one wasn't gonna be enough, but a Hypnosis lands, then a Critical Dream Eater brings the Cotton Bird into the red, KOing with the Sucker Punch next turn as Empoleon comes in last. I overwrite Sucker Punch for Nasty Plot on level up here, putting Empoleon to sleep with Hypnosis and using it once to do a little under half with Dream Eater then using it one more time to put Empoleon into the red as it wakes up, uses Surf, but being in the red is plenty enough for my last power point of Ominous Wind to grab the KO, winning me the fight. Well shoot, <laughs> how is that for Spiritomb's first outing? Pretty damn good if I say so myself. With him handled, I can get into Telmark City, clear out a few bikers, and get ready for the fifth gym here, a Poison-type user. While the level cap is 42, the next level cap is 44, and I don't think I have enough wiggle room if I decide to hit the current cap. So I decided to just stay at level 40, since I think I have enough of an advantage with the ghost type being resistant to poison that I should be completely fine. Beforehand though, I made sure to go north to the Telmark outskirts to grab the TM for Flamethrower, finally upgrading Chandelure from 70 to 90 power, a much welcome boost for late game threats. Gym Leader Sid here starts off with an Arbok, so I go with Spiritomb, obviously, because it has Crunch, which hits all of my team for super effective damage except for Spiritomb. Using Hypnosis and building up two nasty plots as he immediately wakes up, uses a second Crunch, and gets the defense drop. Well, that's rough. At least I have the Berry Juice and the second Hypnosis connect, so Dream Eater can get Spiritomb back to full HP. I think plus four special attacks should be fine throughout this fight, though. Drapion is likely the biggest obstacle here. It goes for Acupressure, getting plus two speed as it falls asleep off of Hypnosis, taking a wee bit over half from Ominous Wind as it, of course, wakes up on turn two of sleep and uses Acupressure again. Thankfully, he boosts another useless stat in defense, allowing Ominous Wind to connect for a second time, getting the Omni Boost and recovering that lost defense from Arbok earlier. Next is Nidoking, and Sludge Bomb does a whopping 10 damage as Ominous Wind grabs the one-shot KO, leaving just Venusaur. Of course, it's the mega evolution of the fight, using Razor Leaf and doing a little under a third of my axe HP, but of course, here's where the luck starts to fall apart. Hypnosis misses twice in a row, allowing for said Razor Leaf and a Toxic to land, so I just shift over to Ominous Wind, bringing him down into the red as a second Razor Leaf brings Spiritomb into the yellow. So I take the turn to swap into Chandelure as he heals up, then fire off two Flamethrowers for the KO, taking a Critical Sludge Bomb for less than half and winning the fight. Not too bad for Spiritomb, would have been another solo fight if I had just clicked on Ominous Wind first and took the two turns to attempt to hit Hypnosis, but I digress. 
Now that I got the HM for rock climb thanks to Herschel at the end of the underground path, I've got access to plenty of new areas, though I don't think I'll do much revisiting until endgame when I need to optimize my team for the Pokemon League. As for right now, the Fairy Ruins are my next objective, where the new elders are once again causing a ruckus, and I need to take down a knight by the name of Ezekiel to clear them out. Huh, I wonder if he has an older brother named Elias. Beforehand though, I make sure to stop further in the Telmerk outskirts to get the Benedite, the only Megastone that pertains to my team at the moment. I might have to grab the Sableite at some point, but I don't even know if I'm going to use that over Spiritomb, so it might be a mute point. That aside, Ezekiel is in the Fairy Ruins, and he's got a rather strong team like most of the bosses in this game, though this many Steel types is probably easy enough for me to take down. He starts out with Skarmory, an easy one-shot with Chandelure's Flamethrower, with Dewblade following suit as Chandelure outspeeds. Third out is Claydol, and this thing has nothing for which to hit my Shedinja, so I swap in, use Shadow Claw for half, then hit Dilly as he swaps out. So I swap for Spiritomb once he uses Ancient Power, digging a critical for a fourth, then a Giga Drain bringing Spiritomb to just below half as the Dairy Juice kicks in. I finally put it to sleep with Hypnosis, setting up Nasty Plots to combat his usage of Amnesia, using another Hypnosis to put him to sleep, then finally getting some Dream Eaters in. They don't do a terribly high amount of damage due to those amnesias, to the point where I miss with Hypnosis and Spiritomb's down to 11 HP. Well, shoot, I don't think I can really do much. I swap into Bayonet, taking a Brian for a quarter as Will-O-Wisp lands during a Giga Drain turn, bringing Bayonet down to around a quarter HP. I'm wearing down the power points pretty quickly at least, so I swap into Chandelure on an expected Giga Drain turn, then into Jellicent on an Ancient Power turn. So I figured I'd swap back and forth to drain the power points, forgetting that Cradilly has already used 5 Giga Drains and therefore uses Ancient Power as I swap back into Chandelure. Doing around 80% as I swap back into Jellicent, use Recover to get back to full, then swap into Shedinja since Cradilly can't really do anything to it when Brian is the only attack it has left. However, what that means, I can go into Bayonet, using another Will-O-Wisp as he just takes turns with Amnesia and wastes them, and I just keep swapping in and out to let the burn take him down. Eventually, though, I do just go into Jellicent and get a Critical Surf, which takes out Cradilly, leading to Agron, who Mega Evolves, taking a Surf for a little over half, setting up Standstorm, then going down next turn to a Surf, leaving just Claydol at half HP. Of course, Surf is a quick KO, rubbing Salt into the wound with a Critical for the win. Yeah, I could have played that a little bit better, but nothing was too terribly wrong at least. The only thing I messed up with was keeping track of the amount of power points that Prey Dilly still had. With Ezekiel done, my rival tells me to go to pre Simos Island to face off against the next gym leader, who happens to be an official character. Will from Johto's Elite Four has taken a stay here and is a psychic type gym leader, so after training to the level cap of 44, it's time to take him down. He leads off with Zatu, what a surprise, so I go with Bayonet, using Shadow Ball for the near KO, lowering the special defense as he uses Calm Mind, undoing that, but somehow, Shadow Ball gets a one-shot after a full restore. Huh, that seems like an awfully large range of damage it could hit, but whatever. Second is Jinx as it goes down to Shadow Claw, easy as day. Executor comes in third, taking a Shadow Claw for around three quarters as Leech Seed hits, but it doesn't do jack because I uh, just KO next turn, though it does activate once Metagross comes in fourth, so that's a little bit kind of unfortunate. I didn't expect it to do that. I forget Leech Seed mechanics. This thing has absolutely nothing but physical moves though, so burning it with Will-O-Wisp on an agility turn is pretty good here, then swapping for Shedinja since it can't hit Shedinja whatsoever, so that's pretty good. I mud slap this thing into Oblivion, then do it again after a Hyper Potion. Last out is Slowbro, and this guy's got a Mega Evolution, but A, it can't hit me, and Shadow Claw can hit this guy super hard. The only thing he can do is use Slack Off to heal off the damage from Shadow Claw, but once he's out of them, lights out, giving me the 6 badge. Two in the lead to go, no losses, but I've had some close calls. Won't be shocked if I have to go into the leftover bag of encounters before long. So this bit of the game is rather strange. It feels like filler, which makes sense. Most Pokemon games have a problem putting something of substance between the 6th and 7th gyms before the main plot ramps up to the crescendo. But this is just me beating up a bunch of burglars. I mean, that's fine. I get some good money out of it, but I'm not really too worried about it. With them out of the way, though, it's time for yet another rival fight. I do appreciate one after every gym or two of these, though. They feel a bit better paced, and you get a good sense of how your rival's team is progressing in comparison to your own. But that's more for a review, not a challenge video. 
He once again starts with Horiyama, and I do the same thing as the last fight, leading off with Spiritomb, getting hit with Knockoff, put him to sleep with Hypnosis, and immediately use Dream Eater. Though I make sure to use it straight away instead of setting up Nasty Plot like I would normally, since I want to put him into the red and see if he has a healing item, but he doesn't, so I instead set up a few Nasty Plots afterwards, firing off an ominous win for the KO as Altaria comes in second. Dragon Pulse puts Spiritomb into the low yellow, but I'm able to put him to sleep with Hypnosis, trying for Dream Eater, but he swaps to Gigalith. Huh. Well, I'm gonna risk it for the biscuit and use Hypnosis again, and it does connect, allowing for me to hit two Dream Eaters to nearly fully heal as Altaria comes back in, and I didn't quite catch it fast enough, but it woke up due to the Natural Cure ability. So I accidentally clicked Dream Eater before getting off an Ominous Wind, but Spiritomb's at too low of HP to do anything else, so I swap into Frostlass with Ice Fang, KOing, and then leading into Rotom, who's swapped into the Heat form. So I use Protect to Scour for an attack, and it's Overheat. So I swap into Jellicent and use two Ominous Winds to take it down, taking a bit over half from Electro Ball, but thanks to an Omni Boost, I'm easily able to destroy the incoming Leafeon with a single Ominous Wind, with Empoleon coming in next. Thankfully, this guy has nothing to hit Shedinja with outside of Swagger, so I can easily just use Mud Slap until he hits it, swap into Bayonet as he continues to set up Sword Stance, take the Metal Claw with Shedinja's Wonder Guard, and just keep using Mud Slap until the Swagger power points are gone. Since this is his last Pokemon, it's only a matter of time before he goes down, with a Critical Shadow Claw finishing the job and winning me the fight. Shedinja is really a useful Pokemon when you actually know the movesets and Pokemon that your opponent is going to have ahead of time. It is not useful for random trainers, because dear lord, there is no real documentation for them. With that, I get the HM for Dive, traveling through the Priestimo's depths, and heading north into Edishore Reach, then into Edishore Town itself, where they're having a Clefairy do a Meteor Dance. Okay, but because it didn't want to, I gotta go rescue it, yada yada, I get it back, get access to the Gyarados Bridge to the east, and head on across into Atsail City, the home of the 7th Gym Leader, Marina. This is a water gym, so I'm probably better off going back to Telmerk City and grabbing Rotom for an easy sweep, but I'm lazy. So after getting to the level cap, it's time to just take her down with the only way Chaotic Meatball knows how, with Brute Unga Bunga Force. Quillfish is the lead for Marina as I go with Spiritomb, putting her to sleep with Hypnosis as she sets up a Rain Dance, then using Nasty Plot thrice while she stays asleep, hitting Ominous Wind at Resolution when she wakes up, using Aqua Jet for minimal damage as Jellicent comes in second. She sees Hypnosis, so immediately goes for Taunt. Too bad I know she has this on her moveset, so I go straight for Ominous Wind to KO, leading to Kingdra. He misses with Hydro Pump, allowing for Spiritomb to KO with another Ominous Wind, then Pelipper comes in, hits Surf, and gets KO'd just as well, leaving Gyarados. It's the Mega Evolution here, and since it's Water Dark now, we've got a resistant Gyarados on our hands. I plan on staying in and still doing a bit of damage with Ominous Wind, but Waterfall manages to get the flinch. But thankfully for me, Gyarados has absolutely nothing in which to hit Shedinja thanks to Quillfish being unable to set up Toxic Spikes while it was out, allowing for an easy victory after spamming Aerial Ace and Metal Claw. To be completely honest, Quillfish and Pelipper were the only two mons to have anything to hit Shedinja with, those being with Toxic Spikes and Fly respectively, so if I had just looked for the TM for Protect, I would have just won on the spot but once again, I'm lazy. That and I literally just checked while I'm talking here and the TM is just unavailable. Well, I guess laziness pays off again. So with the second to last badge in hand, you'd think that this would be a good time to wrap up the story, but you'd be wrong. We actually have the last gym leader to take down before we even get to take out the last of the new elders and fight Regigigas, and by going through the Atsail cold storage and chasing the new elders out of there, I can head to the Apex Temple right away to take out Morgana, the head of the team. She's got a decent team in and of herself, but she's also a ghost type user, meaning I've got a pretty good advantage with Spiritomb. Her lead, Miss Magius, uses a nasty plot, but immediately falls to Dark Pulse, leading to Gengar, Mega Evolving and using Magic Shine, a brand new fairy type move in this game for over half as Dark Pulse proceeds to fell Gengar, putting me up 6 to 3. Getting a 2 for 1 feels pretty good, and I would have gotten a 3 for 1 if it weren't for Sigilith getting a critical flinch with Air Slash, so I swapped a Frostlass, he misses, then I hit Shadow Ball for the near KO, but it's not quite there, so Frostlass takes a Psychic for just over half, healing 20 off of a Berry Juice and getting the KO with a critical bite, leading to Drapion. 
I'm gonna see what he goes for here by using Protect, and he wants Scary Face, so I'm gonna take advantage of that by landing an Ice Fang, getting around a quarter damage off and using Protect again to see what's coming, and it's Night Slash. So I swap into Jellicent in the effort to tank it, but instead he goes for Accupressure, getting a sharp evasion boost as well as an attack boost on the next turn, but Surf hits and KOs so it doesn't matter, leaving just Houndoom to fall to a super effective Surf, winning me the fight. Even with dark types at the end there, it just was not enough. That was a very much clean victory. But turns out she was just a distraction. She traps me into the temple, meaning I've got to do some finagling to get out of here, capturing a Yamask in the Ignis Catacombs while trying. Thankfully, once I'm out, I'm told to head to Loamis Town for the last gym badge, and you know I'm darting my bum over there to get it. The gym leader here is Richter, a ground type user, and... Hilariously enough, I initially thought of Richter Belmont before realizing this is a play on the Richter scale. Tells you how many stupid Nintendo games I play. He leads off with a hip howdon, so of course I'm going with Jellicent, just clicking surf until the cows come home, getting a KO on the hip howdon in one shot as Doug Trio comes out second. It nails Sucker Punch for half, then I miss with surf. Huh, he must have the sand veil ability. Well, it's a good thing I didn't put on the choice specs for this fight. I can swap over to recover and heal that right off without the risk of getting hit by Sucker Punch again, but Sand Attack is really going to put a damper on things, especially with this Endless Sandstorm. Earthquake also hits for around the same amount of damage as Sucker Punch, just a little bit less, but eventually I'm able to recover back to full, only taking a little bit of Sandstorm chip damage before swapping into Frostlash to recover my accuracy. Sand Attack lands on Swap as Sandstorm does some damage, and of course I miss with Ice Fang. Well, it's back out of Frostlass after a Protect, even though this doesn't actually drain a Power Point of Sucker Punch, which is kinda dumb. So I swap into Spiritomb in the hopes of finally KOing this thing, using Hypnosis and trying to get off Nasty Plot, but I just keep missing as Spiritomb takes two Earthquakes and is brought into the Deep Yellow. Man, can I just hit this stupid mole son of a bitch? I swamp back into Jellison and just keep clicking buttons, finally getting Surf to connect as Sucker Punch does just under half, leading to... Oh, you gotta be f***ing kidding me. Garchomp. Mega Garchomp. Yeah, this is worse than I thought. We are going to need a little bit of strategy here, and the strategy is killing off my newly caught Cofagrigus. I want to give Mummy to Garchomp, get KO'd, go and do Frostlass, KO with Ice Fang, and take Mummy, then protect on Excadrill as he goes for Iron Head because that's super effective on Frostlass. But I realize that he doesn't have the Sand Veil ability, so that strategy doesn't actually do anything. So I Heart Swap into Jellicent upon Excadrill coming in, taking an Iron Head for about half of my remaining HP, KOing of Surf, and leaving just Gastrodon. Bayonet's able to come in and survive on just over half from Earthquake and Sandstorm chip damage, Mega Evolving and using Will-O-Wisp to have Gastrodon's attack here, which should be enough to make it so that I can swap into Chandelure on an Earthquake, then into Jellicent for a Muddy Water baited out, but turns out he just goes for the Muddy Water on the turn I go into Chandelure. Thankfully missing, but then also missing the turn I swap into Jellicent, meaning I cannot risk bringing this guy back in because of the Sandstorm damage, because it's just not going to be able to heal from a muddy water. I go ahead and drag in Frostlass here to get some more burn damage, using Protect, then swapping back into Chandelure, taking an Earthquake for less than half damage, then firing off a Nightshade for the KO, and the victory. Yeah, that was a bit of a crazy fight. Way too much accuracy fuckery for me to be happy, and losing Kofagrigus and it's unfortunate, though I wasn't planning on using it for the Elite Four coming up soon, so who am I to care? So for the sake of brevity and the fact that this video is getting to be much longer than I'd like for a single challenge, let's take on these last few battles rapid fire style. Firstly, the rival wants to test me before the final new Elders encounter over in the Icos Canyon. He leads with Hariyama and since he uses a Mega Evolution on this team, I go ahead and lead with my Bayonet and fire mine off straight away, using Will-O-Wisp to burn Hariyama, taking around a third from knockoff, then firing off a critical Shadow Ball to nearly KO. Well, that's a full restore waiting to happen, but I forgot about the chip damage from both the burn and sandstorm. Thankfully, it goes down because of it, and out comes Rotom Heat and uses Overheat, missing as Jellicent gets swapped in, then uses a non-stab Hex for around a third as it goes down to Surf, leading to Leafeon. Now, I'm tempted, I'm very stupidly tempted to go for Sludge Bomb here, but I know better, swapping into Chandelure and taking Leaf Blade for barely anything, KOing with Flamethrower afterwards. 
Out comes Empoleon 4th, and this is quite the threat in the Standstorm. So I swap back into Jellicent predicting a Surf, then go for Ominous Wind in the hopes to get an Omni Boost at some point here. But after missing the first Swagger, the second lands from Empoleon, and there's no point in me to stay in with Jellicent here simply because he doesn't have any physical moves and I shouldn't be trying to keep that plus two. I do try for a turn, but of course I get crap luck and Jellicent hits itself like a truck, so I swap into Spiritomb, getting hit with Earthquake and Swagger, but thankfully, Hypnosis lands, allowing me to swap back into Jellicent and go for Recover during the sleeping turns. I'm able to fully heal as Empoleon stays asleep, using Surf to get slight damage in as to not trigger a potential healing item, then KOing with Ominous Wind all while Empoleon took a lice, long nap. Man, I want one of those. Next out is Gigalith, taking a Surf and surviving on Sturdy as Iron Defense gets set up. Actually, I don't even think that was Sturdy, I think it was just that it survived that low. Not that it matters though, since Gigalith's heal lock now, going down with two more Surfs. Last member on the team is Altaria, which is the Mega, of course, and since it turns into the Fairy type, I see no reason as to not just recover her out of the game with Jellicent, taking Dragon Pulse for a third combined with Sandstorm, then firing off Sludge Bomb for massive super effective damage. Moonblast does around the same amount, combined with Sandstorm does a third, so I heal with Recover, walking into a critical hit, but it's not like it really does much. Eventually, I'm able to wear her down and get her to the point where... She starts using Roost, so now I have to outlast this. Too bad I have Sludge Bomb, and I managed to get the Poison status. See ya, chump. Better luck next time. Morgana's just ahead and wants to fight once more, though the battle goes very similarly to before. I lead Spiritomb, destroying Miss Magius with Dark Pulse. Miss Magius, Miss Magius, I don't care. As she uses Nasty Plot, Mega Gengar comes in second, uses Toxic, Dark Pulse brings it down in one attack. Sigilyph's out third, uses Cosmic Power, I take a Cosmic Dump on it with Dark Pulse for the one shot. Drapion's out fourth, and Spiritomb gets some damage off with Dark Pulse twice, as two Night Slashes do some decent damage, finally forcing Spiritomb out thanks to that Toxic Poison, with Bayonet coming in and barely taking anything from a Poison Fang, KOing with Shadow Ball as Houndoom comes in fifth. I swap for Jellicent, see a Howl, then outspeed to KO with Surf. Last out is the new Salamence, somehow having the move Molten Raise. The move only thought to be known by the champion Salamence, but it's a recovery turn move that does under half to Jellicent, so I just recover my way to victory using two sludge bombs in a row to KO and win. Now before I continue, I've got to grab some throwaway encounters. There's three Elder Knight fights that I'm not covering since they're not special at all, but the third and final fight with Morgana afterwards consists of nine Pokemon without healing in between. So I make sure to go and capture Rotom from the Telmerk warehouses, on edge from the fairy ruins who isn't actually a throwaway i just wanted to hold off since i knew that this thing as soon as i grabbed it would take over the run as the strongest pokemon i had access to l gym in the cosmic caverns for a trade in another area as well as my actual encounter of the area sableye trading said l gym for a drifloon over in the battle marsh next to valoon town last but certainly not least though eevee training Yes, I want to spend the time Eevee training these suckers because I wanted to have the most advantage possible while also being able to sack needless members that are 100% not making it into my Elite Four team like Sableye and Driftblim. And somehow, in the same area as my shiny Joltik from earlier, I find a shiny Paris. I'm just that good, I guess. After taking out the three Elder Knights I fought earlier in the story, it's time to get back at Morgana for trying to resurrect this asshole. And she's rather tough now that she's got the hole in Golems and Regigigas on her side. I lead with Age of Slash against her Miss Magius, using Shadow Sneak to attempt a KO, but it's a range, not getting it on the turn she sets up a nasty plot, but it doesn't matter since she's heal locked now. The second Shadow Sneak does hit the range though, KOing and leading to Gengar, who's a two-shot with Shadow Sneak, hitting a Shadow Ball that would have KO'd if not for the Focus Slash I got over in the Battle Marsh. Third out is Drapion, sharply lowering his attack with King's Shield as he tries to land Night Slash, swapping over to Bayonet and using Will-O-Wisp for another halving of the attack stat, finally going into Spiritomb to attempt a big nasty plot sweep taking multiple Night Slashes and knockoffs for barely any damage whatsoever. Even two criticals from a Night Slash and a knockoff barely brings Spiritomb to above half, allowing it to get to plus six with Nasty Plot, firing off Dark Pulse for the KO as Houndoom comes in next. A critical crunch, of course, puts Spiritomb into the red. That's three criticals in the span of a couple turns, by the way. So while Houndoom is in the red, I need to swap. I go into Chandelure as a safe bet here, taking a Thunderfang, 
and KOing with Hex next turn, leaving just the Sigilith. Huh. Would have paid to have kept that Salamence on your team, though. Hex is able to easily shred through the Sigilith, beating her in the first time, but we've still got four more Titans to trudge through. Back into battle we go, and Regirox in first, as Aegislash is still on 1 HP, but I have Iron Head, so I use King's Shield, then use Iron Head and get a critical. And still don't KO! Wow, I thought that was gonna KO, but thank God for the flinch here. Shadow Sneak gets the KO as Regice comes in second, so I just use King's Shield, and I'm not taking the risk that I took last time with Iron Head, swapping into Chandelure and KOing with two Flamethrowers through an Amnesia to lead into Registeel. Same here, staying with Chandelure and blasting it with two flamethrowers is plenty enough, with a burn on top of it and an ancient power barely doing diddly dick all, even though it's a special move unaffected by said burn. Last out is Regigigas, so I go into my full health Jellicent, who basically can't take damage from anything but Zen Headbutt here. So I just keep spamming Surf, Sludge Bomb, and Recover between Zen Headbutt and, oh, it has Molten Rays. Eventually poisoning it and getting the damage off of a Molten Rays recovery turn to KO, and finally chase off these pesky bastards. About time the police got involved, you know, sometimes it just takes too long. With that, I've got the HM for Waterfall, leaving six fights before the end of the game. Yeah, uh, my rival wants to fight again before the league, I guess. Seems like they should have omitted that last one before the new Elders fights, though I do appreciate the effort of giving him his own surfing sprite here. We once again see the Horiyama lead, and I know he's aiming for knockoff, so because I lead Aegislash, I use the turn 1 King's Shield, lowering his attack and KOing with two aerial aces to follow after taking less than half from knockoff, leading to Rotom. It goes for the overheat, so I use King's Shield, swapping into Jellicent, take a hex and a discharge before KOing with a single surf, leading to Leafeon. Same cycle as the last fight, swap into Chandelure, take a critical Leaf Blade, fire off Flamethrower for the KO. Fourth is Empoleon, and thank god I don't have to fight this thing in the Sandstorm. I swap into Spiritomb to attempt to get off some good damage, but Swagger immediately dashes those hopes. So I swap back into Jellicent on an expected Surf, recovering quite a bit of HP, then doing so next turn with a regular old Recover. But uh, yeah, I accidentally forgot to take the choice specs off, so I swap into Shedinja, taking a swagger, so I swap back out into Jellicent as he swaps into Gigalith. I guess the AI figured out how to play around Wonder Guard. Doesn't matter though, as he swaps into said Gigalith on the turn I go for Jellicent, heal locking him with Surf and KOing as Altaria comes in second to last. This thing has absolutely nothing to hit Shedinja with despite being a flying type initially, so upon Mega Evolution, I swap into it and just start spamming moves. I could not care less that Roost exists, I can far outlast those power points in no time. So in a few turns of Shadow Claw, Aerial Ace, Shadow Sneak, and a few wasted Mud Slaps, since I should be conserving those for Empoleon, in attempt to dodge Swagger, I'm eventually able to take out this fluffy bird from Commission, leaving just Empoleon to stall out with Wonder Guard and Jellison, eventually KOing after the accuracy deprivation with Mud Slap and with Shadow Claw. All right. Now with him out of the way, it's time to talk about my final team for the league. Or, what would have been my final team? See, there was one more encounter that I could have gotten, that being Golet over in the Apex Temple, but the story actually locks this area away after the New Elders plot, meaning I can no longer access this area and obtain Golet. Well, I guess I shouldn't have procrastinated. Score one for the game. Not really a problem though, I simply swapped Golurk out of my plans for Bayonet for the League, and it really doesn't make any additional problems, so I'm completely fine with this. For the team, I'm sitting on Bayonet with Shadow Claw, Knock Off, Will-O-Wisp, and Return, three great physical attacks of different types, Will-O-Wisp for reducing physical attack damage while also doing residual damage to the opponent, all wrapped up with a nice Mega Evolution. Spiritomb with Nasty Plot for boosting Dark Pulse, Shadow Ball, and Psychic, Chandelure is sitting on Calm Mind for boosting Flamethrower, Psychic, and Shadow Ball while also being able to use it defensively. Rodon with Discharge, Thunder Waves, Double Team, and Confuse Ray, which initially the last two slots were supposed to be Reflect and Light Screen, but they're not TMs in this game, unfortunately. Jillison has Scald, Ice Beam, Shadow Ball, and Recover, and while I would have loved to keep Sludge Bomb on here, the League has, like, no good fairy types other than Whimsicott, which is a grass type, which is weak to Ice Beam, along with all of the other grass types from that Elite Four member, as well as the errant dragon types in this league. And plus, Scald also has the burn potential compared to Surf being a vanilla move, and Shadow Ball has higher base power than Ominous Wind. I really don't need to sack my way into an Omni Boost in order to win games. I have more consistent ways of doing that. 
Aegis Slash has Swords Dance, Shadow Claw, Iron Headed King's Shield, a major boosting move, two stab physical moves, and a protect that lowers physical attack by two stages. What more can I ask for? This team is solid, and while Golurk would have been preferred, I think I'm going to be just fine. They're all at the level cap of 58, edge just before 59, and ready to do their final battles. First up is Nicola, a, an electric type user who honestly has nothing to touch Chandelure with thanks to her lead Galvantula. Her only a good attacking move here is Sucker Punch, which does nothing in the face of six Calm Minds getting set up, and since Chandelure can 100% survive through a single Sucker Punch even if it's a critical, I can flamethrower the entire team for one shot to KO and win with the exception of Lantern, that getting KO'd by a Shadow Ball due to being part water type. Alright, second member up is Leaf, the grass type Elite 4 member, and I'm really starting to notice that pattern of names all of a sudden. I make sure to overwrite Shadow Claw for Aerial Ace on Aegis Slash for this fight, since both are TMs, so they're interchangeable, putting them up front against Ludicolo. I set up Sword Stance on turn 1, as I know he's going to use Rain Dance, and now that Swift Swim is active here, I can go for Aerial Ace, safely taking a Surf in the defensive form to KO as Trevenant comes in second. I drain a turn of Rain with King's Shield, KOing next turn with Aerial Ace as Sceptile comes in third, and here's the Mega Evolution as well as a Night Slash, so you better know I'm going for King's Shield. Lowering the attack, then getting hit with Night Slash in the defensive form, firing off Aerial Ace for the KO as Theraforn's in fourth. A combo of Iron Barbs and Power Whip brings Asia Slash down to 6 HP, so I swap into Chandelure and Clean House from here. Using Flamethrower to KO said Ferrothorn, Whimsicott after a Moon Blast, and Among Us in one shot to each to win the match. I. fing sus bastard. Anyway, <laughs> that's still the easiest two out of the way. Now for the middle of the road difficulty. Kara's the fighting type user, and she's got some good moves on Mian Xiao. However, none of them are particularly sus. I'm sorry, I'm gonna stop making Among Us jokes. I go ahead and lead Aegis Slash as she goes with Meditate, allowing me to go for Swords Dance, then use it again as she goes for U Turn, going into Scrafty, and now that I'm plus four, this should be a cakewalk. King's Shield lowers Scrafty's attack, but not like it matters. I just KO next turn with Aerial Ace as Lucario comes in second, using Metal Sound through my King's Shield in order to deliver a powerful Shadow Ball next turn, but it's not enough as Aerial Ace KOs after shifting to the attack stance. Blaziken comes in third, immediately Mega Evolving, and it has Speed Boost, so you better know I'm going for Aerial Ace immediately, taking it down, and Hawlucha comes in fourth. The only good attack this thing has here is Bounce, so he uses it, then I use King's Shield on the second turn as he comes down, KOing with Aerial Ace next turn as the Mian Xiao comes back in, using U-Turn into a King's Shield only to hit it for 2 damage and feed Metacham to an Aerial Ace next turn, leaving the Mian Xiao to come back in, unable to do anything but accept defeat from Aerial Ace. 3 down, 1 to go, and Knight is a Dark type user, the last of the Elite Four. Makes sense I left him for last, as this is actually pretty cool that they let you choose the order unlike games pre-Gen 5 in the main series. Bisharp is the lead here, which does make it a nice lead for Chandelure, but there's no way Sucker Punch doesn't end up doing way too much damage, so I lead with Bayonet instead. I figured Will-O-Wisp was needed here, and Sucker Punch doesn't do anything in the face of a non-attacking move, having the potential threat as I swap into Rotom, seeing a sword stance to undo the burn's downside, well, the one that I wanted the most anyway, but using Confuse Ray just adds onto the mess that he's in, so I swap into Aegislash Slash after that as he uses Sucker Punch, only to set up three sword stances in the face of the burn, using Iron Head on the full restore turn in order to avoid a Sucker Punch, KOing in one shot. See? Sometimes I have good plays. Second out is Weavile, and absolutely this thing is faster than Aegislash. Slash, so King's Shield to lower the attack, get back in defense mode before going back into attack mode next turn, slashing this thing's life away as Malamar comes in third. Wow, I just realized how fitting this thing is a sword soul. It's definitely a Yu-Gi-Oh monster going back and forth between attack and defense position, but I digress. Once again, King's Shield lower the attack of a Night Slash, KO with Iron Head next turn, repeat. Honchkrow almost goes the same way as he's got Sucker Punch. In order to see if I could consistently get that, I went for a Wasted Sword Stance after a King's Shield, but he goes for Thunder Wave here, so I go for King's Shield once more to get another attack drop before KOing with Iron Head, leaving just Absol, the Mega Evolution of the team, as well as Sharpedo, but we'll get to him. 
I go into Spirit Tomb to absorb a Night Slash, barely doing any damage with Shadow Ball, but I do get the special defense drop in the face of back-to-back -back critical hits, bringing him down to 7 HP. Sadly though, for the rest of the team, they're all going to die, so I need a clean switch, and I'm not getting out of here without said losses. So, out you come Bayonet, die for the sins of this team. It's able to get KO'd, which brings in Rotom afterwards, and thanks to it being a speed demon, I'm able to use Discharge to KO both Absol and said last Sharpedo for the win. Going into the champion 5 to 6 is a little bit rough, but Bayonet was a backup member anyway, completely unintended to be in this league, so I'm not necessarily miffed. With my power points all healed up though, Herschel's all that remains between me and the end of this game, and he's got a pretty diverse team, so hopefully I can take him down. He leads off with a Choice Scarf Wielding Waylord, a odd pick but understandable, though Jellison is still fast enough to outspeed and just absorb the Water Spout thanks to Water Absorb, KO with two Shadow Balls after the special defense drop leading to Alakazam. It goes for Shadow Ball, getting a special defense drop of his own, but Shadow Ball is able to bring Alakazam into the red, forcing a full restore as I go for Recover, swapping into Spiritomb next turn to take two Shadow Balls for exactly half, as Dark Pulse and Shadow Ball get the KO on Alakazam, putting me up 5-4. to four. Yeah, this is pretty much where I want to be, and with Yon Mega coming in third, I know exactly who to go into. And oddly enough, it's Jellicent. I'm not wanting to expend Chandelure just yet, and by using Jellicent and alternating Recover and Ice Beam, Yon Mega is unable to do a damn thing about it since it can't outdo my damage, as well as my healing factor eventually taking it out and luring out Tangrowth 4th, which is exactly what I wanted. I want to swap into Chandelure here, having baited this out before the Salamence, KOing with a critical flamethrower after Giga Drain barely does anything to my true starter. Sadly though, uh, fifth is Mamoswine, and this thing is very, very specially defensive. So much so that I hit flamethrower and it doesn't even do half despite being super effective, and Chandelure holding a Charcoal, so it's able to KO with Earthquake. Then I go into Jellicent in the attempt to KO with Surf, being super effective as well, and it goes down also to Earthquake. So, well, this is a very bad predicament. I know that Asia Slash can KO though, so I go into it, though another full restore is in his repertoire. So I go ahead and use Sword Stance, then King Shield, finally using Iron Head to grab the KO, leaving just Salamence. Intimidate brings me down to plus one, which is probably completely useless. After all, here Iron Head does a good chunk over half, and Earthquake does a little under half to me. However, next turn, Earthquake gets a high roll and KOs me on the second shot. I've got two members to his one, but I know Spiritomb because it's already at low health, and can't outspeed is absolutely useless here, getting outsped and destroyed with Flamethrower as Rotom comes in is my final hope. Thankfully, Salamence is part flying type and already well below half HP, allowing for a discharge to grab the KO and the championship, winning me the challenge. And for some reason, four of my Pokemon are not what they actually are in the Hall of Fame. Neat. While this challenge was a long time coming, I'd like to sincerely apologize for the long wait. I definitely didn't intend for it to take this long, but I'm glad that this video feels like it came out as solid as it did, and I hope you enjoyed it. As I said in the intro of this though, if you're interested in more meatball content outside of these challenges, please do check out the links in the description. A lot of my creative juices have been flowing into those videos during the downtime between challenge uploads, and it would mean a lot to me if you check those out. With that said, thank you for watching, stay safe, stay healthy, and I'll see you next time.